Vertical right Torque, uh, Mark India, track 0874, over. Okay, I want to be here at the first hour, reaches GPS at 12, let's turn by the track 12. A firing exercise in the Pacific Ocean. The United States Navy is the most powerful Navy in the world. And the USS Bunker Hill is one of its most dangerous ships. It may not look it. Nowadays, they don't. But appearances can be deceiving. The technology of the modern warship has evolved with one single purpose, the projection of military power. If it is to maintain that power, the warship must continue to evolve. New technology will soon bring a better ship. And yesterday's warship is already history. Warship charts the many changes in technology that have shaped today's fleets. At the center is the capital ship. The ship that at any one time represents the maximum strike power the fleet can deliver. Nowadays, armed with nuclear weapons, it can be the submarine. Six four. Able to strike against targets anywhere from the ocean's invisible depths. Or above the waves, the aircraft carrier. Her armed fighters and bombers capable of enormous range. But before either of them, it was the battleship that was the capital ship of all the world's navies. And it was in the battleship that the earliest technological shifts occurred. This shift would transform the wooden sailing ship into this leviathan of steel and steam. Bunker Hill is not a battleship. The modern navy no longer has battleships on active service. Bunker Hill is a cruiser. Her primary role is to protect. But equipped with the Aegis combat system, SPY 1A 360-degree radar, and a battery of vertical launch missiles, she is, in every sense, what has become of the battleship. All right, me home. As far as surface ships, it is the U.S. Navy's capital ship right now. Our missiles give us a longer range than the battleship's guns against other ships. Our Tomahawk missiles give us a longer range inland against shore targets. We can fire at targets close to a thousand miles away. Green range, clear to fire within safe firing barriers. First toys, attack, two, seven, x-ray. I say again. Through Bunker Hill it will be possible to trace her evolution from those great ships of the line that only 200 years ago fought for and won command of the seas. The dawn of the 19th century was the dawn of the new era. Revolution had freed America from British rule and transformed France into a republic. That same revolutionary spirit had carried Napoleon's army far beyond the frontiers of France. And in 1805, it was ready to invade England. All that stood between Napoleon and complete domination of Europe was the British Navy. And they were in no mood to be challenged. It was such a shock and such a humiliation to have not been able to keep the colonies for King George III that they entered the, the, the war of the French Revolution in probably in as aggressive a frame of mind as the Royal Navy has ever been. Napoleon had the troops and with 24 hours access to the Channel, could have been in England, defeated any possible forces the British had, and overthrown the British state and destroyed the British Empire. It was off Cape Trafalgar where the two greatest naval forces of their day were to meet. On one side, the combined ships of France and Spain. On the other, the British Navy. Complete victory for either side guaranteed dominion of the high seas. 
The British Admiral Horatio Nelson knew this, and he knew the French. The French policy was to go into the wind, attacking the British uh, uh, front. The British would sail down with the wind, and the vanguards would meet. Damage would be done to both sides, and the French could sail away. The French government obviously had the policy of, hey, your job as an admiral is to do as much damage as possible, but we want these ships back. Faced with the threat of invasion, Nelson understood all too well what he had to do. Annihilate the enemy, destroy her fleet, whatever the cost. He knew that the way to beat the enemy was to break their formation and to force on them close-range ship-to-ship engagements. To do this, he had to break the enemy's formation by sailing into it, quite literally, by exposing the bows of his ships, which were relatively weakly protected, to the broad sides of the enemy for quite a long period of time. He wanted the ship to go into harm's way. He knew that this was the weapon that was going to defeat his opponents. It did. What ensued was little short of a massacre. Nelson, Nelson closed the back door on the French, engaged them in a fight to the death. Of the 8,500 dead or wounded, 7,000 were French or Spanish. And this breaking of a line destroyed the French tactic of being able to hit the vanguard of the attacking British ships and then being able to escape to fight again another day. And at Trafalgar, the French fleet was destroyed. Britain had asserted her command of the seas. France, never again during the Napoleonic Wars, managed to assemble enough shipping power to level that threat again. It was gone after Trafalgar. Trafalgar was a truly decisive victory, and there are very few decisive victories in warfare. Nelson's genius was his tactical innovation in a time of technological stability. His own ship, HMS Victory, was 40 years old at the time of the battle, but she was still the finest ship of her day. The sailing battleship of the Nelsonian period was the epitome of technology of its time, and indeed the apogee, the climax of a technological development that had gone over many hundreds of years. The complexity of their rigging, the ability to be able to, able to sail in all sorts of conditions, the ability to keep the sea for many months on end because of the uh, provisions that were put into them and the way that those provisions were provided, all these sorts of carefully nurtured skills and ideas made ships like the Victory the absolute peak of design. The Battle of Trafalgar had been fought between ships at their best. As fighting machines doing the job they were designed to do, no change was But change was inevitable because another revolution had begun, an industrial revolution, and the machine age was to bring with it changes every bit as far-reaching as those born of constitutional reform. In Paris, France, a few years before Trafalgar, an American from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, had been working to convince Napoleon's government that by using the new, largely British industrial technology, he could help them win the war over their common enemy. The American's name was Robert Fulton. Fulton convinces himself that ideologically he's really aligned with the French because they're another democratic revolution as happened in his own country, so he finds it very easy to make an argument that he's going to sell revolutionary new weapons to this government to help destroy the hegemony of Britain, which is ruling the seas tyrannically. Friends of the Yard, 
I send you herewith drawing sketch for a machine that I have constructed and with which I propose to make experiments in causing boats to move on rivers. I think we have to say that Fulton was not doing this for the interest of humanity. He was in it for the interest of Robert Fulton. Robert Fulton is in some ways representative of the early American Republic. It had a terrible inferiority complex about the old world. That is, it felt that it wasn't sophisticated, it wasn't as modern, it wasn't as developed. But at the same time, it had uh, an entrepreneurial, aggressive determination to succeed and prove itself. As a designer, Fulton was highly imaginative, yet not always practical. Underwater cannons, for example. But he did manage to fit a steam engine into a boat on the Seine. It was either the wrong engine or the wrong boat, for it foundered in the fast-moving currents. But Fulton was undeterred. He isn't an innovator, he isn't an engineer, and he doesn't have the kind of technological vision that many of his contemporaries did. Fulton is essentially using other people's ideas and other people's technologies to create a fully integrated system that actually functions. He's able to stand back from the technology. He's not wrapped up in engines. He's not wrapped up in propulsion. He's wrapped up in profit and success. That doesn't mean to say he was not a genius. He was. And it doesn't mean to say that he couldn't get along with other people, unlike a lot of inventors and engineers and others that are creative, let's say. He could get along with people and did. Fulton's designs may have not been practical, but their intent was lethal. Mines, torpedoes, even a sailing submarine. The British watched this with some concern. Here was an idea that might just upset the apple cart if it ever worked. So they finally simply bribed him away. The French government was always resistant to him. He had one interview with Napoleon and was unable to communicate to him all of his ideas. The French Navy didn't like those ideas. Of course, the British Navy didn't like them either. But nonetheless, they lured him away to come and work for them and basically just kept him on retainer, uh, harmlessly puttering around his inventor's shop until the Battle of Trafalgar. Then they were convinced that there was no more threat of invasion, and they didn't have to keep him anymore, and they let him go. And so Robert Fulton returned to America, but not empty-handed. The British, who absolutely forbid the export machine technology, had paid him off with a valuable export license. And what Fulton did was to purchase machinery in England, ship, ship it to the United States, to New York. He went himself, contracted for the building of the vessels, and of course that became the Fulton or the North River Steamboat, or it just sometimes called the Claremont, which was the first commercially successful steamboat in the world. Robert Foot Fulton's little Claremont steamed up the Hudson, a harbinger of change. When the War of 1812 broke out, Fulton immediately turned himself into an American patriot. Having been an English patriot and a French patriot earlier on, he found it quite easy to become an American one. He also realized that the defense of New York Harbor would be difficult with existing sailing ships. So he develops this vessel, the Dima Logos, which is essentially a twin-hulled catamaran with a single large paddle wheel between the hulls and a steam engine driving it. It's a mobile battery. It certainly looked very powerful, to say the least. It carried a battery of some 30 guns. It had five feet thick sides. Uh, and it was an armored ship in that regard. And it could make 